When we came here, that pine tree was standing straight up. Man. Straight, it was perfectly vertical. And we got pictures, we got some pictures of it around here. And then slowly, 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 that sucker leaned a little bit. And all of a sudden, we said, why that tree starting to lean? And Gosh, it seemed like five years later the tree was tree was a little farther, and then five years later the tree was a little farther. It finally fell. Come out here, don't cut the grass. There it was laying in the river. Well, you weren't here when it went down, huh? No, but it made a noise anyway. <laughs> yeah, you don't know that. <laughs> I guarantee you, it made a noise. It said, "Ouch." There used to be a huge oak tree right here that we hung our bucks on. That was our buck pole, and I don't know if there's any remnants of it. Well, it's down there in the water now. You can see pieces of it in the water. Uh, slowly the, the river eroded, and it's kept tilting and tilting until it was too far gone. So then we put our own buck pole up. But, so it uh, makes me feel old, even to talk about that. That's how much it's changed. I've been coming out here for... Mm, 35 years. First thing I always look forward to is just hopping right out of the truck and uh, I go straight over to the right to the edge and just soak it in, take a deep breath. And you hear that river rushing. And well, you hear uh, the river rushing from from your bunk. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that old, like, that puts you right like to sleep. It's like hearing the ocean, you know. <laughs> you hear the river, puts you to sleep until Steve starts snoring. <laughs> It's, uh, I've told my time. wife, when I go to heaven, one of the first things, I'll be taking a uh, shower in the middle branch of the Octagon River with my two Labradors around me. <laughs> so I always shower there September and May. Man, it is cold. <laughs> my dad used to take us out here when I was a little kid all the time. and uh, I want to do that with my kids as well. You know, they're only 10 years old, 8 and 6, so... It's going to be sad to see it leave here, uh, you know, two and a half years I think we have left on the lease, which uh, nobody's happy about. In a time when we're so disconnected from each other and, and nature and all that, to remove one more opportunity where it's, you know, so spontaneous and so prevalent, it's just, it just makes you sad. The Trust for Public Land recently transferred approximately 31,000 acres of land from the Upper Peninsula Energy Corporation to the Ottawa National Forest. This rugged land along the Ontonagon River in Michigan's western Upper Peninsula, originally purchased for its hydroelectric potential, is now protected in its natural scenic state. A significant portion of the land, including 27 miles of Ontonagon River frontage, has been designated as a component of the National Wild and Scenic River System under the Michigan Scenic River Act of 1991. Before the land was transferred to the Forest Service, all year-to-year -year recreational leases were extended to 25 years and the lease fees assigned to the townships. I missed the trip going to camp you know the solitude when you got out to camp especially our camp was you know it's like i said it's five miles of two track to get there and the solitude that's the woods not a finer place to be in the world than in the woods North wind blowing. Probably about zero by now with the north wind blowing. Yeah, you gotta get a few gray whiskers to come up and down this hill. A lot of people won't come here because they know the hill. 
they will not attack it. There is no. Simple as that. I'm not climbing the hill. It's 300 feet from where we sit to the top. And it's vertically about, I don't know the game. Like that. <laughs> Best I can describe it, but yeah, it's not easy for a lot of people. We uh, come to the camp, we park at the end of Three Mile Road. We jump on bike. And we uh, ride our bikes to the top of the hill. And then we throw our backpacks on and come down the hill with a rope. Accessible wise for others, uh, you could be somewhat fit. Where are we going? We are going right Actually, to that we, band. See that little silver speck right there? Mm -hmm. right That's camp. Here, but we end up camp. going down, around, and up. Down We're uh, at the 30 at 6 camp, about uh, 13 miles by canoe south of Ewan on the south branch of the Ontonagon River. Uh, about five miles, we always say, by ATV off the end of the uh, Fair Oaks Road or Palvey Road, whichever way you want to take. And uh, yeah, it's our, our beloved deer camp that we've had since 1977. All right, the gateway to paradise. It's definitely an adventure. That's what we like. I, for years, uh, a lot of the guys would complain about the trail, and I gotta say, when I was younger, it didn't bother me as much. And the older I get, uh, the more I wish it wasn't as rugged. But it's tough. It's it's tough going. It's muddy, and stuff breaks. Last year I pulled a trailer in here, I'll bet you weighed 800 pounds, corn and oh. all the bait and stuff. Never got, well we did get stuck once up here. Yeah, but not bad. Those little black flies are starting to come out, aren't they? Yeah. They're finding us. Yeah. But they don't bite. Yep, we have to maintain it to the, to the forest respects so that uh, I guess other people can come in which they're welcome to do. But, um, oh, it's a, it's a long, hard trail, but like I said, you gotta, you gotta earn it to get to camp, which makes getting here that much better. Isn't there a couple of landmarks that we normally stop at? Yeah. There's like that bench. Yeah, the old couch the we call it. Actually, that's the uh, place we call the uh, Fender Road. This spot on the trail to camp is a, one of our favorite stopping spots, kind of a little opening here. And we call it the Fender Road because uh, there's an old fender in the woods you can see here from a Model T or Model A that for years was hanging in a tree. Of course, the tree has since rotted and fallen over, but Every one of those hills on the way in, they have little names for them, for all the pieces of equipment that were broken while trying to haul <laughs> parts in for the camp. John D. Hill, Muffler Hill, <laughs> Bird Hill, Sand Hill. You have to have names for places in order to talk about them and, and to tell stories, and so you make up names. And, and yeah, they, it's, it's fun, and, and, and they make some sort of sense. Tell the Pecan Flats story. How did, how did that get that name? We were coming home, and Ollie said, stop. He wants an ice cream cone. This is during deer season? Yeah. And uh, I said, ice cream cone. I didn't believe it. I thought he was going to get a fifth or something. <laughs> Here he comes out with a pecan ice cream cone. So we took that road back, and... There a buck comes out of the woods, and bang, I shot it. 
and I thought I'd run him. I told Ollie, go turn around, come back and get me. Well, the deer dropped right on the side of the road. So we threw it in the back of the truck and came home, and then coming down the road there, I banged in one of them holes in that ice cream went against the windshield. <laughs> peak on flats, peak on flats! <laughs> <laughs> No, it's all memories and pictures. I'm gonna miss that old place. Already do, not gonna miss it, already do miss it. Go out there and turn around at the river spot once in a while and look at the river, which we'll do later. Yeah, and yeah we had one of the finest, finest views in the area for a camp. We call it Camp Wood Tick, and we started our lease in 1987. But we are located roughly three and a half miles north of Bruce Crossing, on the middle branch of the Ontonagon. Uh, from the tall pines up there on the point, I would say it's about 300 yards. That's where the snowmobile parked, where we came down from. Well, we chose this spot because um, our ancestors, they had a camp right in the same location. And it was a very nice spot. When I was a child, there was a camp here. And, and then somehow it got burnt down and nobody done nothing with the land after that till we decided to. It was vacant. And you have the water here, nice spring. So we um, uh, contacted UP Power and they gave us a lease. When I went and asked UPCO about a lease, they said, sure, which 40 do you want? Well, I had to give them a legal description. So we had to spend the day out here trying to figure out exactly where, and we picked a spot down the river here, downstream a little way. Yeah, that would be pretty good. That's a nice spot. And I thought, well, let's just wander up here a little further. So right, right here in front, we just stopped for no reason and said, well, look, the bank's down a little bit right there. We'll sit right there and eat lunch. So we're sitting here and eating lunch, talking about the site down there and the pros and cons and how we do the driveway. And it just suddenly popped into one of us. Why not build it right here? This is a perfect spot. So that's how we came to choose this. And we just stopped here to eat lunch. You met Don Kirtland. That's how you found the spot, right? You and... Well, he used to come up here trapping by a river in his younger days. And this was his last spot where he's set his last traps. And uh, when I met him, that's he told me that's the place. I think it was in 75, the year before we had this camp, there was a forest fire right where you're, where you're coming through into here. That's kind of how we found this spot. Where the pumpkins were. I was yeah, out here the with the uh, fire department, and we put a porta pump in the uh, river right here to pump water to fill trucks and stuff like that. And then when the next year, when we started looking for the camp, that we we knew this road was here. One of the nice things about the middle branch of the Atanagan River and its tributaries and its spring holes feeding the river. And I'll tell you, when I was a kid at the old camp, the 85, 90 degrees, and by the spring hole, you go down there, the spring hole feeding the camp, or the uh, the river. Uh, you talk about brook trout, just right by the spring hole. You just put a French spinner out there. It's supper time. So the story goes, I was making well, some letterhead. Well, I want to get back on this for some time. <laughs> the letterhead, I made, I made a letterhead, and he told me it's, uh, you know, from the Yellow Dog Camp on the on the east branch of the Arntonagon River, and That's typing, my typing it in there, put the picture of a deer and all that kind of stuff. But so he printed up 500 copies of this, and he's been still using the same letterhead over the years with the wrong branch of the river. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, we are on the middle branch, and we do know where we're at for the most part. <laughs> Camps along the Ontonagon River and its tributaries can be traced back to the late Archaic period, approximately 4,000 years ago. Prehistoric peoples established hunting and fishing camps and mined copper within the basin. 
During the first half of the 20th century, various branches of the Ontonagon River were harnessed to provide hydroelectric power, the watershed now owned by local power companies. Victoria Dam was constructed in 1931, and the Bond Falls Dam project was completed in 1938. The 1930s also saw the establishment of the Ottawa National Forest. The Upper Peninsula Power Company formed in 1947 through a merger of three Western UP utilities, the Houghton County Electric Light Company, Copper District Power Company, and Iron Range Light and Power Company. In the 1950s, UPCO started leasing one-acre parcels of their land to private individuals to build cabins for recreational purposes and hunting camps. More than 150 families built camps in some of the most remote corners of the woods along picturesque rivers and streams many along the branches of the Ontonagon River. The year-to-year -year UPCO leases were automatically renewable but could be terminated at any time. When we first signed the lease here, it was a year-to-year, -year, and uh, um, we, we knew that, but the history was excellent. I mean, we didn't know anywhere UPCO had ever pulled a lease. And you know, the initial idea, I think, be, behind the uh, power company in, in leasing these out was to generate little uh, for the economy, you know, to that it would have people come in that's land that they weren't using and give uh, a piece of ground to somebody to put up a camp and and it did, it succeeded. It there was a lot of people that came in and put up camps. I was just telling mom today, I remember sitting here, we went for a hike in the woods, I remember sitting on this spot on the hill and you guys saying this would be a great spot for a camp and you know as a 10, 11 year old kid couldn't figure out how they were going to build a camp on a hillside like it was, but it's turned out to be a really good spot. Well, the whole building process in itself was quite an adventure. Very big challenge because of the hill we have behind us. Building it was a zoo, remember that? Because this road is so bad that we had to bring everything in in a pickup. There was no way to bring anything else in. So pickup by pickup load, we brought it brought it all in here. In the old lot of, lot of logs park, they had the old, the old bathroom. It was made out of logs, so we took it apart. That was in 1988 or 89, somewhere around there, when we tore that apart and, and hauled it out to the river five miles with snowmobiles, one log at a time. 42 trips. Took many Many trips up and down that hill by piling lumber together, binding it together and sliding it down a hill. The big hill coming down to camp here, we used to have to take a rope and daisy chain our bikes together and lower the lead bike carrying the material down so we wouldn't lose it going down the hill. Paul drove a load and dropped it right into the, he pulled through the roadbed and out the other side and the overhanging 16 footers just kind of laid right there. In the, in the stream, look a little beaver dam. My brake man behind my four wheeler, or my three wheeler, and uh, <laughs> his front wheel dug in, and the last I remember was hearing him holler and looking over the side as he sailed into the woods. <laughs> so, but he was okay, didn't get hurt, thank God, and all that. So, yeah, we moved it. Piece at a time then, Carry it, had snipped the bands, lumber flies everywhere, floating down the creek, we're trying to grab that, carry it up the bank to reload the truck. We had some friends with bikes that helped haul some that is we called Camp Seven Hill. We came in way around there and hauled in some appliances and you know different odds and ends. First LP tank came in on a stretcher from the fire department. Yeah. Four of us carrying a stretcher and a hundred pounder, yeah. <laughs> and then in the summertime we come back and pick the hottest week of the year to build a shack and we were using the four-wheeler as a horse. We would use, we would, with pulleys and ropes to lift our logs up there. And the last three or four days, the last three days, four days that we were building it, nobody wanted to jump on the four-wheeler and be the horse driver. Well, every, every night after we would be done working, we'd go down to the river and take a bath. And, and all three of us, we had pimples from the top of our butts down to our knees from driving that four-wheeler when it was, <laughs> that was funny. And then even building the hunting camp, uh, I came in one time on the road and there was the three boys nailing the roofing on. They were really, really little. I walked back out. 
There's no way I was going to watch them. I remember straightening out nails to tack the floor down, too. It's yeah. like, who reuses nails? <laughs> Eight penny nails. Yeah. With our hammer, that was it had to have been four ounce hammer. <laughs> four ounces, like yeah. a tack hammer. <laughs> Your mom wouldn't let you use a bigger yeah. hammer. Yeah, they want you to get hurt. <laughs> This camp has all hand split cedar shakes on the whole outside. And we bought some some cedar logs, cut them into firewood sections, and then this used to have a handle on it that one of us would hold and lay it on the top of the log and the other hit it on here with a sledgehammer and get a split on the shakes. And uh, Paul and I hand split over 3,000, uh, about 3,800 cedar shakes. Back in the late 60s, uh, my grandfather, Altoon, or Ali Curdy, and uh, Loni Johnson and Kenny Ahla got together and built the camp. Who found the spot to build it here? I don't mean Ali, Loni. And then that camp burnt down in the winter of 91, I think it was. The summer after, we built, rebuilt this camp here in 93. Bummer is with, with a small wood box. Like, so you wake up in the morning and if you're not firing up all the way through the night, you got frost on your nose. 25 degrees. 20 outside. Time for a fire. Built by Tom Hadia, my brother-in-law. He had a company named TH Steel. Hauled it in by sled. Slid her down the hill. It's going back up the hill. If we have to tear the camp down, yes, it's going back up the hill. We even have our own fire escape. What Uncle Mike made us. Just in case the stairs catch on fire, we got our own set of bridge. Just in case, you know, wood fires, you never know if a camp catches fire. There's a, there's a way out if we need to. My name is Elvin Hedela. I'd like to welcome you to the Agate Hilton Hunting Camp. Originally it was no holds, bar none. There wasn't, yeah. We were at camps that had a bunch of rules. We said we weren't going to have any rules. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, and we did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Back in the roaring 20s, you didn't need any rules. Called Doe Haven, and uh, it was my dad, my dad and uh, Bill Kirsten's dad. They used to work at White Pine together. They worked there for years, and they're driving around. I believe they found this spot and got the lease, and they. Uh, cut logs down, built the camp. It took them five days, $500 to build. The Hillbilly Heaven Camp, the camp here was built in uh, 1976. Uh, the first year, same year I got married, in fact, 38 years ago and kind of crabby because I built it in bird season and I love to hunt birds. And uh, we had a lot of help, we had a lot of fun built with a hammer and nails and a power saw, basically. Uncle Ernie said, well, I got the perfect name for the camp. He said, we're gonna call it Tomorrow Camp because every time there's something to do here, everybody's is saying, well, let's just do it tomorrow. Let's go hunting there, let's do this or let's do that. But hence come the name Tomorrow Camp. The white herb is actually a fishing move on the river too. The white herb is a fishing term. No, 
<laughs> no, it's when a fishing term when you're Wait fishing with a friend going. and you cast directly <laughs> over his shoulder and catch a fish right behind his back. That's wired erping a fish. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> Altoon, he was a pretty uh, popular gentleman, so he had a lot of people uh, that would like to come out and visit, uh, and kind of that's uh, the namesake of the camp was called Altoon's Ale House. Hector Peltola originally built it, so we called it Hector's Shack when we bought it from his son in honor of Hector, but we also, it's also known as four, four W's and an L. That means four winners and a loser. <laughs> the loser's interchangeable. Yeah, everybody's a different loser at times, so it's just one of the one of our camp jokes, you know. Oh, you're the L today. Started in the early 60s with my dad, Hector. And then, of course, my he dad, Hector, died in the, in the 70s, and so then my uncle, Harold, decided to build a camp in the late 80s. We sold our previous camp farther up, and then Harold uh, made this, built this camp in like 89, 88, I believe it was, with the enjoyment of uh, wanting to enjoy the great outdoors. I mean, the upper peninsula, the river of this river is what makes everything as far as our camps. And Uncle Harold just basically comes up here to hunt and to fish. And not only that, but join the camaraderie with the people that come up here to visit. This cabin up here has never, door has never been locked. And that was one of the attributes uh, I, I liked about Harold, and he just liked to come up here and enjoy people, enjoy the outdoors. Sometime this week or next, a subcommittee of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs is expected to recommend that the stream flowing past Harold Peltola's camp in the Upper Peninsula be designated as wild and scenic and protected forever. In 1990, a bill was introduced that ultimately designated segments of six rivers in the western UP as scenic, wild, or recreational under the National Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. The primary purpose of the act is to balance river development with river protection and conservation. The act specifically protects rivers from future hydroelectric development. Opponents of the bill feared condemnation of river corridors by the federal government. UPCO camp leaseholders feared removal of their camps. In March of 1992, the Michigan Scenic Rivers Act passed, placing branches of the Antonangan River under U.S. Forest Service administration. So when they decided, we'd only had the lease about maybe 10 years, mm -hmm. if, if that, when uh, they decided to sell the land, and we didn't know anything about that coming up, we were never offered an opportunity to buy the land. And then we were under the impression when we built it that we would have first option to buy this land if it ever went up for sale. That did come to a surprise to us. We weren't ready for it. We felt as being leaseholders and stuff, we should have had an opportunity to to at least buy, if they're gonna sell it, give us, told us, they, we weren't told anything. They just up and did it, and we were left in the dark. So we just got a letter saying it had been sold, um, and sold to the Trust for Public Lands. This is to notify you that this corporation has given the Trust for Public Land, TPL, an option to buy approximately 34,000 acres of land, which includes the land you currently lease on a year-to-year -year basis from Upper Peninsula Power Company, UPCO. UPCO is a subsidiary of Upper Peninsula Energy Corporation, UPEN. TPL is a national nonprofit land conservation organization dedicated to preserving land for public use. If TPL buys the land, they intend to arrange a simultaneous sale to the U.S. Forest Service. If this occurs, UPEN and TPL have agreed that you will be offered a 25-year lease to replace your current one-year lease. And we were told you can either sign that lease and stay 25 years and get out, or you can get out now. You didn't have to take the lease with them. You could have, you know, denied it. But then what? Well, you'd lost, you'd lost probably. You'd have to take it off. You either sign the lease and uh, otherwise you lose, you lose the cash. So that was it. Yeah. Uh, See, I don't, I didn't even know. No choice. And then it seemed like 25 years was a long way away. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, and we so always hoped something would happen during that 25 years too, that, you know, death do us part thing, but. The acreage involved was purchased by Upco's predecessor companies to control water levels for hydro operations and provide possible future hydroelectric development. The lands, most of which are not in Upco's service area, are no longer necessary for operations. River flows are now regulated by federal and state agencies, and new hydro facilities on this river system are not practicable due to the low volume of water involved and the prohibitive cost of environmental and regulatory requirements. The decision to pursue the sale of these lands was not made lightly. However, since the lands are not needed for our operations, we want to assure that any sale would protect the natural resources, provide for public use and enjoyment, and that current lessees would be treated fairly. The terms of the option do meet these goals. 2017, their camp has to be gone. So that's, we've got two more deer seasons here, this year and next year, and, and that's it. Then we gotta tear it down or burn it or whatever. And uh, it's pretty sad, really. In June of 1992, the sale was complete and the Trust for Public Land transferred 30,693 acres of land to the United States Forest Service as part of the Ottawa National Forest. This land included 155 UPCO lease hunting camps. The leases are still with UPCO, so they're not our leases. The land is our land, but not these leases. So we are administering the leases based on the terms of those leases, and we're honoring those. And we've continued to for almost 25 years, and that's been our intent from the beginning. We are encouraged not to, not to um, acquire land that have have buildings or encumbrances on those. However, this, these particular pieces of land, this 30,000 acres, being right along the Wild and Scenic River and um, right in the very center of the Ottawa National Forest, it just made sense. And especially since we were working with the Trust for Public Lands, who um, worked with UPCO to, um, I, I think, to negotiate uh, a 25-year non-renewable lease. So there was an end point uh, for those for those cabins and that land would, would be returned to a, a natural vegetation. Yeah, I think initially my feelings were, oh, well good, 25 year lease. I was appreciative that UPCO did that on behalf of their leaseholders. I thought that was a pretty cool thing to do and was just looking forward in the next 25 years. As those years go by, my feelings have shifted more toward dread of losing of course, my personal opportunities, but much more importantly, are, are the, the web of people who are affected positively by this place that was going to go away. I've seen the effects. Thank goodness I've lived long enough to see the effects over the lifetime of a child from birth to age 30 and what this has contributed to their lives to become a part of this. Yeah, this is just not a men's camp. It, it's, it's, it's more like for family. Everyone. It's a family camp. Definitely a family camp. That's what you're looking for, your orange jacket so you can go out in the woods? What I've learned from this place is probably how to actually be able to get away and use the woods and enjoy it. If not hunting for something, at least looking at something and appreciating it. That's pretty much what I've learned from being out here is just the... Just uh, being able to pick up the knowledge of uh, appreciating the outdoors and using it a little bit too. Just rub two sticks together and get that going. See it. Or Come just on, a baby. shovel full of ashes from the other stove. <laughs> when you were eight years old, your best thing probably was a stick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I still got my stick it's gun hanging on the side of the woodshed. Mm -hmm. Your stick? The stick oh, gun. The really? stick gun. still hanging out there. A little piece of tubing on top of a stick. It's unbelievable what That's you can what... do with a stick. <laughs> On spruce trees, there's, there's blisters and bubbles. Let's see if I can find some here. Uh, I can break it without getting it all over me. Uh, if you do get cut out in the woods, you can you can break one of the blisters on a spruce tree, and it and the sap that comes out will seal a cut up. And it also it's very sticky. And apparently has some sort of antiseptic qualities also. I've had some pretty nasty cuts over the years and just smear the 
spruce pitch on and it, it'll seal the cut. And that's, uh, that's something you teach the kids also just, you know, just for fun and games that, you know, you can, you can actually find things out in the woods that are, that are good for you. And every time we mention we're coming out here, they're chomping at the bit. I never tell them a week in advance because that's all I hear for a week. <laughs> we tell them the day of, we're going to camp and they'll play outside for hours. It doesn't matter what the weather is. Happy birthday, dear Colton. Happy birthday to you. One more time. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Hey, Colton, blow your candles out. All right, can you All right, make a wish and blow them out. It's a highlight for Colton. His birthday's, you know, today, October 5th, and. He's had several birthday parties out here at camp. I've got pictures of him out on the deck eating chocolate cake at a year old. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Not a bad backdrop for a one-year-old to have a birthday party at. Wow, look at that. Thanks. Hunting Whoa, bass, look at that. Hunting jacket. Hunting bass. What does it say? <laughs> Thank you. Jake. Oh, that looks nice, Cole. That we can see if you're... <laughs> That's a nice vest. You can see it when you're opening it. Yay! Wow. Now we can go get a bird. This is for me. Hey. Hey, look, Mom. You don't know. Careful. You don't have to tear the box. Or open the box. The baby is all Careful. done. Careful. Now he's ready. What is that? Pocket knife! Now he's Oh, no. We can have here, here. here we are at camp. We're disconnected from technology and you know we sit and play more games with the kids and you know look at the stars take a sound and tell stories oh bob here's you reading colton a book uh -huh. at the stream me and bob catch fish in the stream period we catch big fish and little fish period in the stream, we scoop water into buckets and bring them back up to the sauna. The end. You're not going to go? I'm going to go. There you go. Go over there. Go over there. <laughs> In the youth hunt last year, he, he shot his second deer right back here behind the camp. Him and Billy were sitting in the stand there on afternoon and dropped it right in his tracks. You know, he was, uh, I was, I was probably more excited and more proud than, you know, <laughs> than he was. As I was watching out the window and they're sitting back in the blind here and dropped it right there. It was something else. It was a very memorable moment. i never forget it, you know. When you're here, your father's teaching you how to hunt, how to fish. Um, firearms, uh, how, how to live off the land, essentially, you know, back to your roots, and uh, a lot of manual labor, which is, uh, makes you appreciate what you have at home. I mean, I got the best memories of my life here with my dad. Uh, he showed me, you know, how to hunt, how to fish, how to do everything here, you know, and I lost my dad when I was 13 years old. So I can say uh, the best memories I have pretty much all my life of my dad have been right here you know it's just sad to see if, I mean if we do lose it that uh, our kids won't be able to appreciate it and do the same things and learn the same things all my dad taught me I guess I could say my uh, my oldest daughter actually on the way out here almost made me cry she says uh, I want to be able to bring my kids to camp you know I was like, wow. yeah well, I don't think it's gonna happen but hopefully People are trying to make a difference, you know. It'd be nice to be able to have this place for her kids to see. And...
we having for lunch? Probably hot dogs. My mom bought hot dogs. Hot dogs? Mm -hmm. I heard something about peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter, jelly, and hot dogs. Hamburgers, brat. S'mores. S'mores? Oh. We keep uh, this book on the table that's been here since 76 and we started uh, when a kid was years ago you had to be 14 years old to hunt deer so they couldn't sign the book till they were 14 you know they could come to camp but they couldn't sign the book so I don't know how it happened he missed last year and so it, we had our signing in ceremony last. So we just continued that. He signed the book for the first time uh, last night. Was that you, the first, first grandson that signed in? Yeah. Okay. Nick Call, yeah, 76. First grandson to sign into the camp. You know, so. Look, he's an old man now. <laughs> so. That's what you're going to look like in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> and Dick's grandson uh, is handicapped, and if it, if it, we weren't able to come in with the road, uh, he wouldn't be able to come and enjoy his time here. He's gone out and sat uh, deer hunted on occasion, and uh, if if the camp was gone and they burned the road, there's no way that that uh, boy would have been able to experience those. Uh, times and events at camp. Every one of my kids, and they're adults now and have kids of their own, and Pete's kids, every one of them caught their first book trout right here. Most of my sons, I got three sons, shot their first deer here. My grandkids were here just a few weeks ago. All my grandkids caught their first trout here. And I mean, if the Forest Service cares about promoting wildlife and people being out and enjoying nature, they should come and see that. Like today, with the ATVers here. And a month ago, when my grandkids were swimming in the river here, I mean, they're gonna lock this place up? Uh, it just doesn't make sense. We, we promote outdoor activities. And that's what concerns me about taking these camps away and putting the land away, is that we're removing that opportunity for all these kids to grow up having an experience and future generations to have a true wilderness experience because these camps are here, not because they're gone. And to recognize what the wilderness experience is, that it's not just that popping in here for a photo shoot. It is, you know, sit here on the river, listen to it. You know, it's just a special place. And while I it's really a good idea uh, to say, you know, we need to save this. Um, there's nothing that we are presently doing that is contrary to that. We're the best stewards of this place. And part of the uphill battle, I think, that uh, this scenario that these camps are facing is I've watched this mentality within the government or these departments to suggest, they don't say it outright, right, outright, <laughs> But they do in their policies, and they do it through the rulemaking process when they suggest rules. And that is that, for the most part, any human activity in what they would deem to be more of a wilderness type area or remote areas is always in the negative. And therefore, in a way to preserve and keep it as they see it should be kept, human beings need to stay out. A couple years ago, I was fishing down the river. I was. Right around the corner, I caught a nice big brook trout, and Colton and my dad were sitting on the deck, and I held up that trout, boom, slipped right back into the river. Mm -hmm. 
that thing must have been. Yeah, between, that's between, this small. between the eyes. <laughs> uh, As I was growing up, Alton would always tell me, Alton and Kenny, they both tell me, oh, there's big brones in that river. Well, I'd fish and fish and fish, and all I'd catch is these little six-inch brookies most of the time. And then, oh, you gotta put your time in, gotta put your time in. And, yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, about, well, it was about a year, maybe a little bit over a year after uh, Altoon passed away, I was uh, going to school at Michigan Tech, and I came down for the day, and I was uh, fishing just, there's a little uh, hole down here, just downstream from the camp a little bit, and just fishing, and I look, and down on the, on the next to the riverbank, there is a, a huge trout. I'm like, wow, can't believe this. So I sat there, and I fished that for it for probably a good 10, 15 minutes. Scared it off twice. Finally, I took out a, a a blue fox spinner. I just remember I right in front of its nose and bam, I got it. Uh, but it ended up being a, a five pound brown. It was a beautiful fish. And you know, after those guys telling me that all those years, oh, there's big browns in there. And they were right. I was really hoping I'd be able to show all to in that one. It wasn't a bad one to release though. So he was super fresh, so. Nice male. It was a good fish. Let them go, let them grow, then the, be back. The last yeah. one I got down there was a female, and I took her right off the bed, and I cast it right up in there, right in the perfect spot. There was like this much room to make a cast without getting snagged up on the brush. And as soon as that rapa got over the top of that brush, she smoked it. Well, I tore one of her gills, so we had to take her, but she only had four eggs left in her gut. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, so she was good. spawned all. She was done. And in our case, we have hunting and fishing. Uh, some of the best anywhere any place in the United States, just getting out there, but you don't realize how many fish we've let back in the river. We didn't kill everything in the forest. We did not trap everything in the forest. That way we get to see animals over and over and over. I've been seeing them for over 50 years in this spot, and uh, um, my kids have seen them for however long they've been alive. So. Yeah, we're gonna go for a little walk. Oh wait, right here, look in here. We started about nine in the morning. I got like a, a one mile loop right here that I do at the camp. And then I got a big four mile loop that I do when I go out north with her. And uh, that's what we do. If you stay off the trails, you don't see any, not one person. And that's how I like it. Just me and her. And we scratch and work hard and we get about a dozen birds a year and I get a nice meal for deer camp and that's all I care about. <laughs> Ellie, Ellie, come find a bird. Ellie, come here, come here, right here. Look in there, go look in there. Find him in there, he's in there. Find a bird, find him in there, find him. Look for him, look for him. We had one gentleman, uh, Ralph, Ralph got a letter, he actually left a letter here. Ralph knows yeah. the story behind that a little bit better than I do. His name is Marty Kepke from, he was a fisheries biologist for the state of Wisconsin. And Sackett's, I, I left him a message, a note, you know, stating that I'd fished the area quite a bit. And would they mind if I parked at their camp? You know, I, I immediately called him back and told him anytime he wants to park here, go ahead. And I said, if you happen to see a pup tent, pitched by it, you know, don't worry because some nights I sometimes I like to spend a night in the woods and just head back the next morning. Well, about an hour later, I think it was, I got a voicemail. You didn't have to stay in no damn tent. You know, we gave him the spare key and said, you know, go sleep on our couch if you want to sleep, you know. there. He said the one, he has slept in here a few times, he said that one one evening it was supposed to rain really hard, so he figured he'd take us up on, a, on our offer. And he came out the next morning and there was a few inches of water right here in the lawn, so he was quite happy to have a nice dry couch to sleep on. <laughs> it's pretty nice of him. And I finally met them the last weekend of the season. And he said if we bump into each other this summer, that he'd show me how to run the generator and all this stuff. He said he'd do anything he could to help a veteran. And now we are right here, basically we're right here, just above the walking bridge, what I call the walking bridge one. You know, what's the difference you pitch a tent or have a camp? I, I have no problem with those camps being there. 
personally, it doesn't bother me a bit. Um, just, they've been there forever. They don't hurt anything. God bless them. <laughs> I, I envy them. <laughs> Whoop, there's one. A small one, but he's there. Just a little one, probably six inches. Okay, buddy, come on. I'm gonna put you back. If these camps do go, these roads aren't gonna be accessible to, to people to come in here and actually enjoy the river. Older people, they can't walk in here. It's a long way is in here. It's about two miles, about two miles from any direction back out to a road. So without the camp, camps out here, with the people using these roads, they're gonna just deteriorate to the point you can't even drive in and nobody's gonna be able to walk out here and enjoy it, especially elderly people or handicapped people. They'll never get out here. And I know I had a friend of mine contact Ironwood Office of the Forest Service, and he asked them, well, you know, why do we, why do we have to remove these camps? And he was told by them, apparently, that, uh, well, we're monopolizing the river, you know, this area has to be shared by everyone. If they're saying that we're monopolizing this area, I just can't agree with that. I mean, if anybody wants to come down here, they, they're more than welcome to come down here. Anybody who wants to come down here and set up a tent anywhere near here, they're, they're happy. They can come in and use my camp. I've got no issue with that at all, so I don't, I don't believe that excuse washes with me. You know, it's so everybody else can use the land, and the land belongs to everybody, and, and, and I remember saying, well, I understand that. You know, we don't own it, we don't try to own it, but we're just using it. We're just leasing it, we, we know that. You know, go out and find another place to hunt. It's basically what, what I was told, you know, they just don't understand, it's not that easy. Their uh, response, uh, when I inquired about, was that they don't have, they don't have the authority. This this uh, forest doesn't have the authority to issue these types of leases. They're not our leases to extend, even if we had the ability to extend, which we don't. The the Forest Service doesn't lease land anywhere. However, they do issue permits for uh, special uses for. Uh, on national forest lands like ski resorts or um, other items where somebody has a, a use that's not a public use or it's a, a use that's uh, restricted in some form or fashion and so th that does occur. One special use permit that exists on national forest lands across the country is a recreation residence permit. The recreation residence program was instituted by Congress in 1915 in a time when Americans were being encouraged to get out and vacation in the national forests. Until the 1960s, private individuals were granted renewable permits to construct or maintain summer homes on designated tracks within the national forests for an annual fee. But as time has passed, as the decades have passed, it's, it's one of those things that we no longer need to try to get people to come to national forest lands. People do use them, they do love them, they recreate on them. In 1976, a moratorium was placed on the program and no new recreational residence permits were granted. Approximately 14,000 recreational residence cabins still exist on national forest lands across the country, 22 within the Ottawa National Forest. We're following our policy as an agency. We're not established, you know, the agency isn't establishing new recreation residence tracks. And so we aren't establishing anything like that because we don't have the authority to do that. We're charged with uh, managing that public land for the, the American public and, and really our, our forest plan, which was written in 2006, is really our contract with the American people. So when we, when we did put that out in draft form, we talked to that in the public. Um, not only local people, but people across the country responded and, and talked about what they want, what they hope to see in the Ottawa National Forest. And you know, as we move forward with projects, whether that's a timber sale or um, improving improving a recreational area, we always have to refer to that plan because that's what we that's what we contracted with the American people to do. And and part of that plan says no new recreational residences. I mean, that's written right into the plan. And then when you look at that along with the leases that end in 2017, it's, 
you know, it's just, that's, that's what we have made our commitments to. Moving these people out of there fits their ideology. So they're actually governing us through their rules. They're not interested in coordinating really with the public and with people that are in these scenarios because they don't want you there to start with. So they almost have the upper hand going in. Back when we first, when we first, uh, the, the leases first came up, we held meetings, several meetings. They had a all 120, at the time there was 125, if I remember right, there was 125 leases. They held a big meeting in the UN school and and trying to see what we could do about to keep our leases. And the Forest Service guy says, be lucky you get what you got. And be lucky we didn't shut you down now. With the weight of law or with the weight of rule, either one, they come in with the full weight of the federal government. And how does the little guy fight that? You can't. You're, you're, you're crushed in a sense and you can't fight it. To his friends, I knew that are past now. We um, tried to fight a little bit, you know, and but as they passed, and we just kept on getting the same word, no. You know, I've almost kind of given up hope. I, I've quit fighting the fight at this point. Um, I would love to be, able to, to be able to keep it and keep it up. You know, if we had the chance to renew the lease, that'd be great, you know. Um, but. Uh, I guess if there was some kind of movement, I'd certainly join in. Um, but uh, I've almost got the feeling that it's just peeing in the ocean at this point. It's just too big of a fight to, to take up. I don't think you're going to get any support from the federal level agencies, the, the agencies themselves. You might hear from a, an agent in the field with having some compassion and looking at it and go, yeah, this really isn't that the right avenue but they're really not going to go to bat and fight to see that it gets changed. It's the rule is the rule. You know, I think the, the Forest Service and certainly the employees of the Forest Service uh, appreciate that that was, that was a fantastic opportunity for a number of people who, who were leaseholders or who are leaseholders, um, both in terms of recreation and, and to a certain extent economic uh, activity in the area. Um, you know, at the same time, there's there's a value to uh, those leases ending and having that those properties be available to all people on, uh, who visit the Ottawa National Forest. A couple of, we heard the voices, and we came down from the camp, and um, there was two gentlemen walking down here with nothing much, just their clothes, and they were shocked to see us pop out of the woods. And we're like, where are we? Well, we described that you're on the end of, roughly at the end of Three Mile Road, north of Bruce Crossing. Well, they didn't know where Bruce Crossing was then, and they know where Bruce Crossing is, but they didn't know, didn't know where Three Mile was, because they were canoers. About three miles upriver, they lost their canoe in a log jam, and they were on their way walking the riverbank I mean, walking the riverbank, they didn't know no shortcuts, they were lost. They were heading the military. Well, good thing we were here. So we, we brought them up, up the hill and up the clay bank actually and out to the bikes and gave them a ride to Topo's bar where they were, they spent the night and, but they were grateful to run across us because it would have took them another day to walk from here to military because they were following a river, you know, they didn't know any way, any any better way but to follow the river, which the river twists and winds and it takes a long time. There could have been people looking for them, you know, by a day or two, but lucky we were here. I put my sled in the river down by Kirtland's camp, down by Fensel's camp, about, I don't know, 25 years ago or something like that. And if it hadn't been for their camp, I probably would have died too, you know. Mm -hmm. Put that son of a bitch down and 10 feet of water and sitting there hanging on to the ice like this and the, and the current was taking my feet away, you know, and it was like, okay, this is, it's over with now, you know. And I had, I was kicking around and my foot hit a branch from a tree that was in there 
and that hitting that branch was just enough to get my foot on the ice. But I had to let go of the ice at the same time to get out of the hole. That was scary. You know? so I had to let go and put the head down in the water in a lot for a lot to get the leg up. You know? And holy Christ, you know, it says I finally crawled out of that hole and I'm on the right in the middle of the river. I got the hole that I just went through on one side and another hole on the other side. So I was shit, I'm sitting right in the middle of the river with nothing, you know. Well, now what do I do? <laughs> well Dean was Dean come back for me. You know, and he tore a tree down out in the out in the woods and laid it over the one hole so I could crawl over that tree to get there. And then he broke the trail to to Kirtland's camp. You know, and then I walked to their camp and then while I was in there warming up a little bit, he took his snowmobile and drove and broke the trail out to the out to the main road out there on the on the South Fair Oaks Road. Yeah. You know. wow. So then we got out of there. I never slept for two days. Our next year will be, uh, if you count the number of years, next year will be our 40th year, 40th camp year. And uh, over the years, the log has been filled by people that we've had snowmobilers in the middle of the winter from Minnesota come in here. The place is never locked. Or if there's a padlock on it, the key is hanging right above it. The door to the river side is always open. So we've had snowmobilers in here take refuge and have have lunch here. Um, we've had fishermen, I don't know how many fishermen have told us that they've used the outhouse here. You can see the outhouse from the river. So a lot of fishermen that fish here have, have uh, enjoyed the facilities here as well. So. Hopefully they, we hope they extend the leases. We, you know, praying to, we do that or they do that. The federal government, but uh, you know, we try to be good land stewards of the property, and we spend our money up here and do our grocery shopping and, and what have you, and get a couple, a couple of taverns to hit football games and get a beer and burger, you know. So, uh, you know, buy our gas up here, etc. You know. Throughout the summer, every time we come here, you know we. We buy our, our groceries and our ice and, and buy our, our propane gas and Bruce Crossing. Uh, we spend a lot of money, as, as do all the other camps in the local area. You know, we buy, you know, locally and we do things locally and those people coming from out of town, they're buying a fender at the Big Valley Body Shop because they don't want their wife to know they ran into a tree. Um, <laughs> lumber for the camp, a uh, roof, a window got yeah, broke, they're there getting that fixed. The co-op, if the co-op ain't got it, like they say, you don't need it, it's there. Your propane for your camp or your lights or your Outback co-op, a and hardware for those miscellaneous supplies. Um, yeah. The, this whole community right now, mines are shut down, paper mills shut down. Uh, there isn't a whole lot going on except our, our outdoor uh, activities. Uh, thank God we got them because I don't know what else would be left. Look at the people on the ATVs today. They came here and looked at this and loved it. and They, they, they had a great time riding through the, the trails. Two years from now they won't be able to do that. They won't be able to drive an ATV in here. It'll be blocked off. And, I mean. That, that's what we can sell. We can sell our outdoors. You know, we don't have much else going on in the UP. So. And I think our local townships stand to lose some money tax-wise, right? In our case, it's Haight Township that gets the income from our camp or our shack. And the amount we pay to them right now uh, with the taxes and the lease is upwards of $500 a year. That's if you had this yourself, you wouldn't pay $500 a year in taxes on it. Right. So multiply that times the number of leases that they have, and it's, it's a nice little income for a small township. Our towns cannot afford to lose that revenue. I mean, you take a little town like Boos Crossing or Trout Creek or Ewan, and you take seven or 8,000 or 10,000, somebody said today 15,000. Um, out of their budget, you're going to hurt those townships. Look at that.
pasty. Oh, you're not the camp cooks, no. <laughs> Bunch of bologna and... Uh... Just cans you can throw into the fire and then pull them out and eat the Vienna sausage and ravioli. And... You hear stories of other camps where they're... Well, you got people that don't know how to cook, but it's always been like a tradition here that, gosh, everybody was always had their specialty and jumped right into the cooking, you know. It's always been part of our deer season is the meals. Yeah. And I'm not kidding you, we, I've always left 15 pounds oh, yeah. Deer yeah. after oh, deer yeah. season. Always. And I never trudged through the snow and walked so much <laughs> as deer season, yeah. but get exercise, but holy cow, the food. He usually brings us. Yeah, milk. he usually feeds, brings venison feed, and he's got everything. He's got the whole kitchen tied up, and every pot and pan, and <laughs> piece of silverware used up. Saute seasoning. Yeah, it's all, all the special sauces. He seasoning. still won't reveal some of his recipes, though. But. Dave does the partridge, and no, Willie does now. <laughs> you still do the wild turkey. And Willie Dave, does. Dave makes one of the greatest venison meatloafs I've ever tasted. Oh yeah. Smoke a big pile of salmon and have that all all week and give it away to people that visit and bring some home. It's, it's getting hard to mix up the menu now over the years because we all expect them meals. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, if I took it off the menu, I think everybody would be really disappointed. Well, what, what did you do that for? <laughs> we, have, we like certain things that we've known are good. We know how to cook them. We know we like them. And so the menu kind of tends to stay the same year after year. One time somebody said to me, since I kind of in charge of the menus and the food. They said, are we going to eat the same thing as we did last year? Are we eat the same thing again? I said, you haven't had it in a year. <laughs> <laughs> last year we had uh, pulled pork with gravy, bear ribs, pasties. Got to have pasties in here. Oh, We're in the UP here. <laughs> Every year we post the menu because then everybody can look at it and know the day they're cooking because everybody's... You know, this is mine, this is Lee's, that's Lee's, this was one of our guests, that's Dave's, that's mine, that's mine, that's Lee's, that's mine, <laughs> and there's Dave. So it goes, out. so it goes. You know, we leave here in the morning after Uncle Keith started up a big breakfast and everything, and we go out there and I talked about lunch counter. But we'd all get together and get in the middle of the woods and sit there for a couple hours just roasting hot dogs and they're warming up chili and, and talking about, uh, just everything in the world, really. It just, that's what I'm going to miss. Going to camp is camp life. Yeah, right. You it's, know, it's getting out and everybody doing their own chores, whether it's cutting wood, bringing in wood, getting right. water for the, doing the dishes, uh, doing the dishes. You see the boys uh, doing stuff out here. I'm sure their mothers know that they don't do it home. Right, they wash dishes. You know, they, that's, that, last that, night these, they, they hauled water from the river to fill a bucket, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, uh, and without bitching about it, too, you know, it's, it, it's something that has to be done. Except for today. <laughs> dishes, except he get down to the A. And uh, sometimes I cook breakfast out here. And. What's the first thing you do when you get here, I was telling her? Mow the lawn. No, normally what's your first thing you do? You can hear Call, it right now. Gas up, get the generator gassed up nope. and going. The clock. <laughs> I love the clock. <laughs> well, there's a lot of work that's needed to, be, to maintain a camp. I realize that every time I come up here with my kids. <laughs> I gotta do everything, but you know, the, Hauling sauna water and uh, river water for uh, kitchen, cooking, cleaning. Speaking of which, we need to go water up the sauna again, don't we? Yeah. Lee's kind of a thinker. You know, every camp should have a thinker. And uh, then then you need doers after the guy thinks about it, then you gotta do it. So we hook the pump on the end of the pipe. And we come over here. And we pick this up. We clean it out like this. We lower that down into the water.
when we had a dozen people staying here, you had to haul a lot of water. So when I finally had a dream and I dreamt this thing up, I got the Shack Your Year Award after I came up with this one because nobody had to haul all them buckets anymore. Actually, this year, didn't bring the little Cheyenne room, so didn't bring the generator up. So we're going to uh, we're gonna do a bucket brigade <laughs> up the hill to get to... To fill that up, we we're going to tie some buckets to Gigantor <laughs> and put some snacks up up on the hill. <laughs> Just run up the hill, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, <laughs> still work out the details on that. <laughs> but gotta have the sauna for sure. always wanted to build a sauna out here and we fought him on it and fought him on it. Oh, we don't need to be building a sauna. First year we had it, first time we said, oh my God, that was the best idea you ever had. We, we always leave the sauna unlocked. We don't have a lock on the sauna. And we, and we try to keep, uh, we always keep a supply of dry firewood inside in case anybody ever needs to build a fire in a hurry, in the, especially in the winter. We hang our hunting clothes out here in the evening, um, overnight, it's because well, <laughs> we always make sausage or bacon in the morning for breakfast, and that tends to cling to wool. So it gives us a good place to keep our, our, our hunting clothes scent free and dry. We named it the Rat House. Actually, it should be the Rod Rod House. I was finally corrected in the pronunciation of his. Name. I've known him for 30 years. So we make at least 30 years. Yeah, I brought uh, quite a few of the supplies for the building the sauna, so they honored me my we naming it after. Theater. JG, uh, my dad Joe Gallatin and then Joe Gallatin Jr., Billy Kirsten. Sitting here while people are cooking dinner yep. and taking a steam, that's the best feeling in your life when that deer's hanging in that tree. And there's snow on the ground and you're taking a sauna. First swim in oh. the river. There's nothing better. Hunting season is not just that one five, six, seven, eight day period. It's it's the trips that you make up before that. You know, to haul in supplies and all the fun you have doing that. This was some good hardwood from Dad's that we had. Can't find good hardwood out here. Gotta cut just dead stuff. This metal, if you're wondering why that's there, we have to put it there so the porcupines don't eat our camp. They, all, they like our camp almost as much as we do. Never had a problem through all the years we've been here without blowdowns and the good dry wood. We made some firewood for our deer season. How's that better? Gotta go check out the blind, see if it's still standing. That was tomorrow. Yeah, good enough. I'm here every hunting season. Uh, years ago, I used to be, well, when we first built it, it was all of us, Willie and Roy and everybody I mentioned. We all were here in the beginning and other friends, but as we got older, some passed. And now it's just my daughter and my son-in-laws and mainly it's just been two of us now. My son-in-law, I call him my son-in-law. <laughs> had to make Justin a rack, rack wall. In case he keeps shooting more than me the next couple of years.
nó có cần gì đó cái Well, we'll give her a little more boiling time. We'll hang it, we'll hang it on that rope so nothing gets with it. Another box on the wall. There we are. Yeah. Groovy. See? Yeah. Both, maybe this year we can put one on each side, eh? I guess next episode is take a hike, eh? And all, that dolly rode it from way up there in her own. Oh, we're gonna cut to the left. Gonna take that. We're gonna have this whole play bank open again someday. All the way to over there, like it was when we were kids. Good recent track. Deer season is special up here, and well, I don't have to tell anyone around here how special deer hunting is, but the buck report on the AM radio every evening where the uh, the local scores are reported, but you know, the deer wise, but the camp send messages to and from other camps. It's just, you know, occasionally there'll be a camp that you know of or the person that they're talking about or, you know, it just makes you realize how connected you are to so many places, to so many people, just by coming up here, you know, a couple couple weeks a year. Oh, and just so you know, we do have FM radio here in the UP now. How is things going today at Loggers Alley? Yeah, we weighed in three deer here today. Okay. And, uh, Three uh, so call-ins, I guess. Already. Todd Fetzel set a five point hundred forty-five pounds. Uh, Dave Curdy ten point hundred eighty-two pounds, and Jason Vandenberg five point hundred twenty pounds. That's over at the the Fetzel camp. Yeah, get up, fire up the old coffee pot. You know, you can hear the smell the bacon going and whatnot. Getting the old ironclad army ready to get out in the woods and. You know, smoke coming out of the chimney and the young kids coming up, you know, just eager at 5.30 in the morning getting ready to go hunting with Dad. You're not going to have that anymore. Uh, no more camps. No more deer season. No more deer hunting. No more tradition. No more history. That's part of our culture up here for years, for decades. That's going to be taken away from us. Now, I understand the U.S. Forest Service and our government is really careful 
on protecting our species, our wetlands, which I am all for, but how about our culture and history as well? I foresee if these camps are gone, then nobody's gonna use this place. This river will be probably, they'll burn the roads off, or maybe they'll make a big road where it'll be like a park. So, where does it leave the deer camps? You know, this is gonna be our 37th deer season. I can't remember, uh, you know, maybe a couple little arguments, but I mean, hardly, we've just gotten along so well I mean it's it's more like brothers than than friends I mean it's we're a pretty tight-knit group and I think more than just deer hunting it's just we can't wait to just spend two weeks together I mean we've been friends a long time I've heard of two biggest bucks ever killed at the barn hunt I believe this one was 87 no 89 and 95 I, that was muzzleloading. Yeah. Uh, I danced with my daughter. <laughs> she was there. So yeah, she didn't. Uh, it's the first time she'd ever witnessed it. She didn't know that when you shot a buck, you got so excited that you danced around. <laughs> yeah, we were uh, we were we were muzzleloading hunting and at the father-in-law's camp just down the river. If somebody asks where the moose came from, we tell them behind arts. Behind arts. That's if that's they ask camp. where the antelope came from, we tell them back behind arts. And <laughs> any, the ducks and the pheasants and everything else, when anybody ever asks, we get them all from behind arts. Behind arts. Deer camp, there's, there's no better way to define uh, being one in nature and it's never been about shooting a deer. It's always been about the camaraderie with the guys and teaching your kids, uh, you know, how to survive and toughen it out and get through tough times. And it's been wonderful. I can't tell you the amount of laughs we had in this place. It just we don't see Uncle Corn that often, you know, because yeah. he's a busy man. So this is the time to catch up and see what he's up to and. Tell stories. And after about four days, everybody has uh, Had gigantoritis or <laughs> Roscoeitis or tippinitis. <laughs> one, one of three. Mostly gigantoritis or MacGyveritis. <laughs> Normally. It's six foot four. <laughs> and some in some places. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> we have this Top Gun trophy right here. <laughs> And right last year is Steve, Chris, and James. So we got the top guns here. Just wanted to point that out. <laughs> See who's top gun this year. There you go. Mm -hmm. We like doing the early thing. We're big, big bow hunters. So it's kind of nice to get up here, and you, that's you know that's where it, where it pays off. When you're you're actually getting out there. You can't just show up the day before opening day and expect to see something. So that's um that's what's been cool and. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know what it is about this place. I just, I, I think about it all the time when I'm, uh, when I'm home out of season and in summertime and just can't, I, you know, coming up to the trip, coming up to camp here is something I, th you know, really anticipate throughout the year. So, I mean, I'm already thinking about next year's trip. I've got better deer hunting where I live, you know, but it's not the same. You got to come to deer camp. And we've, we've shot, don't get me wrong, we've shot some really nice bucks here, um, but uh, it's not about the hunting. It's about, it's, it's about uh, it's about the people. It's about the people coming to camp, and and uh, it used to be my dad and the old people when I was young and my kids were little. And now my kids are big, and now my grandkids are coming, and uh, now I'm the old guy. I'm the old guy. Pete and I are the old guys yeah. now. We're the old guys at camp, but you know what? Uh, I'd love to see my sons be the old guys in here someday, but it, unfortunately it's not going to happen, I, I don't think. First year I had my deer by 9 o'clock and came back to camp to get my dad and Colton. And we went and hauled it out of the woods. For us to build this camp now in Keelana County, the same size, I'm guessing, with all the restrictions, would probably cost us fifty, sixty thousand dollars for a camp. Um, 
most people can't justify that. And it's, uh, so it, the, the tradition of deer camp is going to die. Well, the lease has expired January 1st, 2017, and then at that time, any property that has not been removed actually becomes under the ownership of the U.S. government 90 days after that date. It'll never come out in, in one, one or two pieces. You know, it's 50 years old is what we figure. Um, it won't come in here, isn't that white? I mean... Right, it's going to have to be taken, taken apart and hauled away and probably thrown in a landfill or something. We can't, we're not going to be able to take it apart and put it back together somewhere else. Yeah. It's just going to be a complete waste of, of a camp. We'd have to remove everything that they say is non-perishable, you know, your glass, or your stoves, anything. And everything we want that we put into this thing as far as, you know, our mounts, our table, you know, things that mean something to us. Even the lumber, like I say, it came from my parents' property. If, if it comes to that, it's burning it down. That's gonna hurt. Uh, I can't burn it. I, qu I could not burn this place. Uh, I plan on taking it, my, my plan is, I told Pete, I said, I'm 70 and he's 67, 68. So we're going to take the camp down, we're going to put it in our, my basement. <laughs> we're going to put the, the, the original camp would fit in my basement. I said, so, so, I mean, I would love to do that in a way. Take the interior of my camp with the stove and the table and everything else and, and put it in my basement. And I'll call Pete and say, come on over, we're going to camp. And then we'll go downstairs. <laughs> Without the Forest Service help to uh, do some road modification to allow us to break the camp into chunks and take it out on a low boy or a trailer, if we could at least do that, um, it would be easier to comply with the terms of the lease. But under the current requirements, we're not allowed and, and of course, don't cut any trees or dig any holes or do any grading. And so it's uh, going to be very difficult to get this camp down and, and get it out of here. But we don't talk about it a whole lot just yet. I mean, we naturally we have a little, but and Lee has an ex exit strategy, I guess you'd call it. But. If they're calling it the end of it is the January 1st of the 17th, then we wouldn't be able to stay here deer season on the 16th. So our strategy is going to be just that, I guess. Tearing it down the 17th, or the, the year 17. And bulldozing it, but I mean, other than a strategy, a strategy, I guess that's everybody's strategy, isn't it? Got 90 days after that to remove it, so I might wait till the 89th day, so we'll see. But we understand that this is a pretty unique situation, and so I know we have made, um, made the commitment to uh, help folks to make it as easy as possible so they can re remove the materials from those camps. So if that means working with those folks to find the, the, the right season or to um, assist if there's some trees that need to be removed to, to get those camps out, we're willing to do that. I would be honest with you, I, at my age, I'm not ready to build a new camp. You know, maybe these guys will build one, but uh, then I'll go to their camp. I mean, a lot of the talk is, you know, we we love coming up here because it's a unique to this part of the of the state. It's a real unique um, scenario experience. But you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna buy something, do we buy this far away, or we get something over more towards Newberry, something a little closer, so we can use it, a, you know, a little more often? I, you know. I really wrestled with the question of whether it would be worth it to come up to a place that's not this place. You know, and these people here, uh, my lifelong friends, are reasons why I will, will probably do that. But I'll always long for the ambience of this place in which it happened. You know, it's just... There's so many stories in this building. Little ones, big ones. A friend of mine said, we broke our old buck pole, which was just a stick lodged up in the trees. And 
He said, I'll make you a new buck pole. So I said, great. Well, I didn't realize he was going to do this. He did a first class job making this out of steel pipe. And there's a hook up there, one for each of the four of us. But then his friends got involved too. They hauled it to the, to the nearest bar and got together that afternoon. They were going to bring it in here and, and install it. But first they decided they should paint it Congo pink. So Congo pink it has been all these years. And now they put it on the radio. Every year they call in during the buck report, they want to say hi to the guys out at the, the big huskies out at the camp at the pink buck pole. I'll be nervous there, George. It's probably about, I'd say, you now about 10 years ago now running, I had a partridge on the trail. There was a, or the bridge I was talking about that Shane and I built. Right in that area, we'd always see this bird. It was there for seven years, seven years in a row, and I know it was the same bird, same bird because it always come to me. It started when I'd come down on a bike, and he'd fly and land right on the bike. And he'd sit there with you on the bike. If you went slow, he'd ride right with you. But it was always in that one certain area. I've got pictures of him. Matter of fact, I've got one on the back wall here, a big blow of him. I used to be able to sit right on the ground with him and just talk to him and, like, just pet his head with a piece of straw and all his hay, you know, and he'd just sit there and make all these purring noises, and it was just awesome. And I, I had happened to be bow hunting, right, in that crick bottom that one day and I got up in my tree and I'm sitting there in my stand with my bow in my lap and I can hear this brrrt, 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 brrrt. well here comes that bird he's flying from branch to branch to branch to branch and pretty soon he's he's right alongside of me and I'm talking to this partridge in this tree he's like what are you doing here you know I'm hunting you can't be up here and he jumps up on my bow walks along my arm up on my shoulder and he's sitting on my head and I swear to God this is the truth and I've got a chook on a old chook on and he's sitting on my head, and my chook is going like this, and he's walking around on my head, and I'm thinking to myself, man, if I could film this, I'd be a millionaire. There's no doubt about it. Going to camp is, I, it's, it's your favorite, it's your favorite vacation spot. It's a destination. Everybody calls it camp, you know, and you're going to camp. If you, you know, and if you think about it, the words don't make sense. Let's go to camp. What does that mean? You know. I don't know. It's almost like a um, there's a sense of peace that comes when you say I'm going to camp. Um, you just you just start to relax the minute you decide you're going to camp. I, going to camp means uh, getting away from the uh, everyday life of hustle and bustle, and reconnecting with uh, friends, relatives, and uh, brothers and cousins and brother-in-laws and get to know them, mm -hmm. really get to know them in mean, a small area, you know. Yeah, I can't, that's, yeah. that about sums it yeah, up right there. It's, it's connecting with family and getting to know people. Why yeah. do you get Frankensteinitis you know, that's and yeah. That's the most articulate I've ever seen on um, Uncle Corn there. Well, thank yeah, you I think the that. treasurer just came out right there. Wow, yes. This is camp and I, I, we won't have it no other way. I mean, I wouldn't want power. I wouldn't want none of that stuff. I mean, that's not camp to me. I don't want telephone lines and, you know, all that. That's, that's not camp, you know. Gas lights and, you know, you know, gas stove and the guy saying the same old stories <laughs> around the table. It doesn't get any better. I, I love coming out here and cutting grass and working my ass off. And I, we love it too. Right? I, I love it, I do. <laughs> it's, it's how I relax. Uh, I, Frankly, I don't know what I'm going to do when it's gone. I'm, I'm, I'm frightened by that thought. I, I try not to I block it out. I want to enjoy the now, but I was 22 years old when we built this place. My whole adult life has been out here. <laughs> Scary thought. Time to move on, Will. Whether it's this camp or the other 125 or however many camps there are, uh, you won't even notice that we're there. We just... Uh, just memories of the guys that were part of those camps. And that's uh, Uh, 
that's our Uncle Keith's coat right there. It's probably nobody appreciated that. <coughs> the Norwich Bluffin, this very morning, Uncle Keith. Christ, I gotta take them hats out of there. When I tear the camp down, I'm gonna have to find another place to hang all those hats. And, and I was hoping someday I could hang my hat, or my kids could hang my hat next to the, my dad and my sister and brother and my friends' hats. This is Roy Boy Sornin, who I love to death. This is my father-in-law's hat. This is my sister's hat. This is another hat of my dad's, I think, yeah. When my sister passed away two years ago, she gave me this cowboy, she's, she had this big cowboy hat. And in her will, she said, you gotta give this to Bimbo to hang in the camp with dad and Bill's, her brothers and her dad's hats. So it's hanging there right now. So I gotta move one hat over here. My brother Bill's hat is right here. It's Cromer. And he was a beautiful man. He was a big old teddy bear. He cried when he got to deer camp, and he cried when he left deer camp. At the end of May, we were all here, and we spread out Harold's ashes on the river and around the camp. Really nice time to see Harold's friends up here. In memory of Harold. Person that really enjoyed the his camp. I swear, uh, uh, his wife Dodo always said that Harold took care, better care of this camp than uh, the, the lawn than he did our own lawn. <laughs> he may be gone, but he's not forgotten and he's not lost, and you can still feel his soul with you. The spirit. And I think nobody more would be happier to see this legacy continue than our forefathers of the camps that are gone, like my dad, my grandfather, and now my uncle. A lot of memories here. My dad passed away in 91 when I was 16, so, uh, you know, we continue to come out here and have good memories here, mm -hmm. you know. My dad used to take us out here when I was a little kid all the time. And This is the spot. This is the spot for me. I mean, and this is it. This was my dad's spot. I mean, they loved it, and part of them's here right now, I feel. You know, my dad's here with us. I mean, that's how I feel when I come here. It'll be sad to see all the camps go. You know, I spend just as much time at so many other camps other than just our camp. I'll be, I'll be bummer to see you go. You know, there's, uh, like I mentioned, Armistice Camp. We go down there quite a bit. Uh, Elvin Hedla's camp. Uh, uh, Joe uh, Fensel's camp. There's so many camps that we go, whether it's on canoe trips or going out to snowmobile as a destination. But we miss the camp, that, and the coming down here and just sitting and listening to the river. Like, um, every time I come down here, almost without fail, I can be sitting outside and I'll see an eagle fly down the river, either downstream or upstream. And that's, I, I, I don't think I've ever come down here not seen one flying by. That's stuff like that I would have missed, you know. Sitting on the deck and have a red squirrel come out of the branch and start chattering at you and end up having a conversation with them as you're sitting there looking at them, you know. Those are the things I'm going to miss very much. Yeah, you'd like to at least really see it live on, you know, but to move them, it's next to impossible. And, you know, the guys that built these, you know, they didn't build them to take apart. You know, they build them to withstand the rigors of uh, Michigan UP winter. You know, you can't just lightly tack that together, you know. It has to be done with enthusiasm and vigor, <laughs> you know. You, this has got to stand up to 100 plus inches of snow, you know. It's, Temperature changes, you know, this year from, you know, oh God, close to 100 degree temperature variations. You know, it's pretty phenomenal. You know, they're the testament, you know, they're a shrine. They're a shrine to the UP, to the way of life, to the history. You know, to come into this place and do this with no running water or electricity, people don't have a, a grasp on that, you know, that's, that's just beautiful. You know, it's talk about getting in touch with your ancestry, you know, your... This is the way it was for everybody. This is how they live. Just the sheer beauty of it is overwhelming. I 
don't see a way out of this situation. I completely understand why people want to keep their cabins. It makes sense to me. I mean, I get that. <laughs> it's, it's lovely to be able to have that, but this is such a unique thing. It was so it was so unusual that the Forest Service acquired land that actually had the cabins in the first place. It's looking a little tired out here. No doubt about it. We need to do some painting and some repairs, but you hate to do too much if you know you're going to be tearing it down in a couple of years, you know? So, not just enough to keep it going, I guess. I hate to see it go. All the work we put into it and all the memories and let it be here for anyone to come and enjoy. When these leases come to an end, uh, some of those roads will, will remain open, some will probably be closed, but all those areas will be available for hunting, fishing, accessing the river, um, and they'll be available to all the American public. So it's, it's not like there, there will not these areas won't be available, they will be available. It'll just be a different use. I think it hit me the hardest when, after we had Colton, he started growing up and he's so into the outdoors and um, watching him just beg to go to camp. Let's go to camp and want to spend the night out here and get so excited and um, seeing the look on his face when we get out in the woods and go fishing. I mean, how many times have you pulled him out of the river? But, you know, just all those experiences of being out here and away from technology almost, you know, being together as a family that, you know, a lot of people just don't enjoy that so much anymore. And then knowing that, you know, as you start counting down the years, it seemed like so far out, and then all of a sudden you're counting, oh, he's never going to be able to enjoy deer hunting out here and you know she won't either she's four I told you earlier about how many kids have been here and enjoyed this this girl was from North Carolina she says deep in the woods past the sunny side you will find a little cabin after the bumpy ride and once you are there you will see how much fun you can have fishing all day coming home with lots of laughs the river may be cold the furniture rather old who cares if there's no TV and the joke's told rather cheesy? Have fun while it lasts, because soon it will be in the past. Enjoy your stay. She did. She had a great time here. Um, here's pretty much, you can see the opening right here. This is where the camp was. You know, we walked in the door here. There was the wood stove right here. And we had a big, big picture window, bay window right here. And we had a loft in the back with a door going out the back to the woodshed. And uh, yeah, as you're watching it go and you're tearing it down, you remember, you know, every time you every time you haul something out, you know, you think, oh man, remember hauling this in, you know, and it's like you had a good time, you know, it's you probably shed a couple of tears even, you know, it's when it was time to Time to pack it up, watching that last little bit of fire. So long. So long to a lifestyle. When we knew, when we, knew we were going to tear it down and get rid of it this winter, we hauled all the metal out of here and all the and all the stoves and everything. There's no metal now, just this hunk of wood left. And it's been here since 54 or 5, somewhere in there. There's been a few different people staying in it. Uh, after my uncles died and my dad died. and Almost everybody, everybody that started this is gone. And now this is going to be gone. <laughs> it's, it's a shame that it's got to go. Like I said, if I could get, a, get another 10 year lease or something, I'd put one up and be up by the 4th of July. They're not gonna let me. There's a lot of, I still have some grandkids that have been out here at last, as far as they're, they're only two, three, four years old. I wish they could see it or have a part of it, but it's all done. It's a shame though too, because it's, it's taught 
not only me, stuff about the woods, my kids about the woods, all my cousins. And we've all been here. I, I dare say there's had to be, oh, two to 300 people sleeping that thing since it's been built. And now it's gone. You need a match? You want me to do it? I don't know if they're cussing at me from up there or if they're happy. <laughs> well, here's to it. <laughs> Get <over here. laughs> You don't have to put it out. Dear little cabin, I loved you so long, and now I must bid you goodbye. I felt you with laughter, I thrilled you with song. Your walls, they've witnessed a weariful fight. But oh, in my triumph, I'm dreary tonight. Goodbye. Goodbye, little cabin, to you. How cold, still, and lonely, how weary you seem, a last wistful look, and I'll go. Oh, will you remember the lad with his dream, the lad that you comforted so? The shadows enfold you, it's drawing tonight, the evening star needles the sky, and huh, but it's stinging and stabbing my sight. God bless you, old cabin. Goodbye.